Hello, and welcome to Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We are going to hear stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. It is your host, Catherine here. If you don't know who I am, I am the podcast host. I am a mental health expert, licensed therapist in California, and I also offer career coaching as well as professional mental health trainings for organizations. I'm so glad that you found my podcast. Today, we are talking about veterinary social work. And this is a field that, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with, but I'm excited to learn more about. And I was doing some research on what kind of salaries we can expect for veterinary social workers, because generally this is going to be a social work role where you are supporting the people or the clients, whatever you want to call them, that come in with their animals and a lot and doing a lot of grief work with them, right? So pet loss grief is real and you will be doing a lot of grief work within your role. And our guest today, she is, uh, her name is Emily Carveth and she is an LMSW. She's a veterinary social worker for a large specialty and emergency veterinary practice in Connecticut. She earned her MSW in 2022 from Fairview University, Fairfield, I'm sorry, Fairfield University, and her bachelor's in 2004 from the University of Richmond. Emily is dedicated to supporting the emotional health and well-being of humans that accompany animals and is passionate about uplifting the veterinary community. She is currently living in Connecticut with her partner, and her 17-year-old cat, Roland. So I'm really excited to have you listen in to this interview with Emily because we're going to talk about her role as a veterinary social worker. What does this entail? What is the good, bad, and the ugly of it? Um, But before that, I did some research, and today it is um, February 2023. And on Indeed, I just did a general search for veterinary social work roles. And I'm seeing a huge range in salary here, anywhere from $50,000 up to $92,000 a year. So just something that you, for you to know, right? Do this research ahead of time so that you know in your area, in your state, what is the going salary. Um, Indeed.com is a good place for that. Also, Glassdoor.com is a good place to find salary information. Before we hop into the episode, I want to remind you of two things. One, I am hosting a webinar called Success in Clinical Social Work, and this is going to give you all everything I have, right? Tips, tools, strategies, one, for increasing your income, two, understanding the clinical supervision and licensing process, and three, how do we stay well in social work? How do we stay resilient and build those resiliency skills? That's coming up on February 21st, 2023. So the link is in the show notes. Make sure you register for that right now. Do not forget. If you cannot join me live, then I will send the recording to you. No worries. I got you. Second, I do want to let you know about the RISE directory. If you are in need of a clinical supervisor, Go check out the RISE directory. There are supervisors from all over the country. We have over 100 of them listed in there. Go check them out. Contact them. If you are a clinical supervisor yourself, we need you on this directory. We need to know that you exist. So definitely go and sign up for your free profile right now. And with that, let's hop into this episode. 
Hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. We are here with Alemony, Alemony, sorry, <laughs> Emily Carveth at LMSW. <laughs> How are you doing, Emily? Welcome to the podcast. I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes. I'm excited to, to talk with you today um, about your work as a veterinary social worker. So Thank tell you. us first a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. So I am, um, I just graduated with my MSW last year um, and I became interested and I'm a veterinary social worker at a large um, specialty and emergency practice in Connecticut. Um, and I became interested in veterinary social work because I was, worked in the veterinary fields for about 16 years before getting into social work. I had a lot of different roles, veterinary assistant, front desk, kind of you name it, and learned about veterinary social work as I was getting ready to apply to my MSW. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> I know where I'm going. This is perfect. Um, so this has been my dream all along, ever since I started down my social work path. And I am now their full-time social worker and I support both the clients and the staff of the hospital. Oh, interesting. Clients and yes. the staff. Okay. Yes. So, so what do you do as a veterinary social worker? Like what does this role entail? There's a lot to it. Um, I had another social worker who was shadowing me. She said, you've got your fingers in about 15 different pies. And it does feel like that sometimes. Um, so my day, every day of mine looks a little bit different. Um, on the staff end of things, I can provide short-term counseling for staff members. Some folks will come to me because they know they want to start therapy of their own. And I can be a bridge in between and help them get set up with a counselor of their own. Um, and staff members can come talk to me about anything. I really try to make that, you know, very clear for them. So, because my hope is if I can make, say, something in their personal life a little bit easier, then maybe their work experience will be a little bit better. And I work in conjunction with our EAP to support their mental health or community resources that they may need. And then I also do some workshops for the staff. I'm building some workshops on communication techniques to help them communicate with each other on the floor because things can get really tense sometimes. It's very tough clinical situations that they're a part of. Um, and also how to speak with the clients effectively. Um, I'm building another workshop with a grief specialist about helping our staff members understand what grief looks like and what mourning looks like because um, that can be scary for some folks and we do see a lot um and then on the client side most of how i support the clients is with end of life and euthanasia support um, so i can be there for owners during euthanasia um, some folks like to talk to me before that to help with their end of life planning for their pets and that can help with anticipatory grief that they might have um, and I do offer short-term pet loss focused grief counseling for clients after their pet has passed away. Um, and similar to the staff kind of act as a bridge where if they feel like they need long-term support, I can help refer them to an outside counselor that works well with pet loss and grief. Um, and then I also run some support groups for our clients. We have a group for folks whose pet has passed away. And then we also have a group for pet caregivers where their pets are still alive, but they're facing chronic conditions like diabetes or chronic kidney disease or cancer. And, you know, we realize that those folks often don't get the emotional support that they need. And it's been really wonderful. It's, I run it along with an MSW student who's interested in veterinary social work. And it's been a really, really great process so far. Wow, that's amazing. I love it because you are working on so many different levels in different things. So it's not just one on one grief counseling, right? But you're doing micro Correct. and you're doing mezzo with mm -hmm. those, um, those workshops and the public speaking and the trainings. Mm -hmm. I love this. 
differently. I love it. Yeah. And I, I also try to do a little bit on the macro level as well. Like sometimes I'll advise our upper management if say staff members are having a tough time interacting with each other, I can be um, like a conflict mediator for those folks and give our upper management folks some insight about what might be going on. So it is a wonderful opportunity to work on all three levels of social work practice. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And I also didn't realize it makes complete sense when you say it out loud, but I didn't realize that you are also supporting the staff as well as the clients. Cause I was thinking just the clients, but um, it's very similar to a lot of different roles that we have. I know when I was working in hospice, I, my part of my job was supporting the staff and supporting the nurses and um, not necessarily the doctor, but like my fellow colleagues, because like you said, they're, they might struggle too, right? There's a mm-hmm. lot of ethical dilemmas that might come up. There's a lot of really tense uh, conversations that can be had. And I yes. do like also too, that you are working on their communication and relationship skills, customer service skills, in order to be able to have those really difficult conversations. I mean, it must be so important. It sounds very, very powerful, you know, what you're doing. It is, it's, it's a tough job sometimes. Um, and it can be overwhelming, but it's also incredibly rewarded. Um, especially when I really am very passionate about supporting the staff because I was, you know, I was one of them at one point and to help arm them with some skills that can make their appointments go better and help them feel more connected to the clients and help with that compassion fatigue and burnout that can happen in the field, that moral distress that they face all the time. It's, it means so much to me to be able to do that. Right, right. And thank you for bringing those up. I did a podcast episode a while back that I talked to, it's titled, um, What If It's Not Burnout? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, because we hear the term burnout a lot, mm-hmm. but it, we might not be there. We might be expressing exactly like you said, compassion fatigue, moral distress. Um, so a lot of different factors that go into that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, cause you support the staff and you know what it was like to be there and now you're there as the support person. And even as the liaison to upper management and leadership, who supports you, Emily? That is a good question. Um, so I do have an onsite supervisor, um, that does help me, um, like meet me where I'm at. And she has been a wonderful support for me. I do have an LCSW that provides me clinical supervision outside the hospital. She has been part of my life for a long time. She mentored me um, all through grad school. And then I asked her to become my clinical supervisor because I would like to get my LCSW at some point. Um, So she has been invaluable. And sometimes I see her for supervision twice a week because it can be a lot. And we also are very lucky in the veterinary social work community. We have an email listserv that's out of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And that has been invaluable for me. I've made so many wonderful connections with veterinary social workers all over the country and in Canada. Um, There's also some folks that are not specifically social workers, but other mental health professionals that are working in the field or veterinarians that are really interested in this type of work. And they have been a game changer (laughs) for me. I had some really wonderful social workers that virtually held my hand as I navigated my first year in this job. And they still do. They still really do. Yeah. Yeah. There's a special vibe that happens when you get together with other people who do what you do and they just get it. Mm -hmm. It's a whole Mm -hmm. different language. (laughs) It really is. I love talking to other social workers. It's, it just is so important. And I love to be there for, I'm starting to be that person for newer social workers that are interested in veterinary social workers. And it makes me feel so good. And often it renews my enthusiasm and helps with my own emotional exhaustion just to talk to someone else who's interested. Like I remember my why and why I love it. 
It's true. Yes. Yes. That goes so far, especially when, when life gets hard and, and we do have those really hard days. Hey, it's Catherine here. I hope you're enjoying this episode. We're going to take a quick break to listen to this ad from our sponsor. Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. If you're planning to take the BBS Law and Ethics exam, the ASWB Master's or Clinical Licensure exam, or if you're studying for the MFT exam, then you need a proven program that can help you understand the exam questions and pass with confidence. If this is you, I highly recommend the Therapist Development Center. I personally use TDC to pass my law and ethics and clinical exams and found the program provided me with everything I needed to pass with confidence. TDC's program integrates various ways of learning in an organized fashion, containing all of the information you need to pass without the overwhelm. And now bonus, TDC is also offering a library of continuing education courses that fulfill your license renewal requirements and will support you in your career development. If this sounds like something that you need, visit their website, therapistdevelopmentcenter.com and use the code SWRISE10 at checkout to receive 10% off any of their CE courses, including their brand new course, On the Edge of Life, an introduction to suicidality. You can also check out the link in the show notes. Which, you know, speaking of, I'm kind of wondering, you know, what would you say is the most challenging part of your role? For me, I think there's a couple of things. Um, Because of my unique background, I do experience counter-transference towards the staff. And I have to look at that and really own that and be very kind to myself about that because I know I'm in a fairly unique position. A lot of other veterinary social workers um, did not have a veterinary background, but I feel very close to the staff and sometimes very perceptive of the staff. And I have to make sure that I'm talking to folks outside of veterinary medicine sometimes so I can protect my heart a little bit. And then also the other challenging part for me is being there for the clients in the midst of their grief and loss that has that is an ongoing journey for me to learn how to be a grief steward without becoming lost in the grief myself and um i had heard from some veteran veterinary social workers that you'll always be more affected by the pets and the family that are similar to you so I have a, an elderly black cat at home. And when I see an elderly black cat in the in the hospital, I have to be like cope ahead, like DBT cope ahead. Just know, okay, I'm probably going to be more affected by this and really give myself permission to feel that grief too, because it's valid. Um, and, it, but yeah, that has, that is still a journey for me because I, I can't help but be touched deeply. I'm with folks on the worst day of their life. And it's profound and it's hard at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It is really hard. And I remember in hospice, similar, similar stories, right? Like Mm -hmm. people who remind me of my own friends or my own family or my grandmother. Oh, forget it. I'm just a pile of tears when I leave there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and so for me, it, it was really, like you said, being aware of it, right? Like, okay, being aware that you're going to have counter transference likely with this person or when it's starting to develop, right? Because we do develop those relationships that we just didn't expect. Um, And for me, it was like a constant practice of having to set this mental boundary and remind Mm -hmm. myself, this is not my family. This is not my friends. Yes, 
I care for them, but this is not my journey. Mm -hmm. And so that reminder would help me when I started Mm -hmm. to become too emotionally involved. And when I felt myself going home, feeling heavy with these emotions, you know, but allowing myself that reflection, did I do everything that I could within my position, right? Or did I empower them to do what they need to do, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can't, be the 100% of their needs and it's not our role to. So I'm wondering for you, I know you're still on this journey and I think it's an ongoing journey for everybody, but what's helped you kind of have that mental or emotional boundary? Um, Definitely talking it out with folks when I'm feeling particularly affected by a client or a staff member, just sharing about it, getting it out of me is very helpful. Um, Also reminding myself of the, I love the concept of a good enough parent. And I've tried to adopt that for myself as a good enough grief steward, because I've realized for the most part for my folks that are grieving that I work with, they, all they really need and all I can really be there for them is a resource and a safe space and someone to validate what they're going through. I, I remember in the beginning, I was very concerned that I wasn't clinically sophisticated enough and that I wasn't using enough interventions. And when I keep reminding myself, just meet them where they're at, meet them where they're at, just focus on what does it seem like they need and be that safe presence for them and reminding myself that I'm good enough just as that is very helpful for me to keep going and keep engaging in the work. And honestly, sometimes I'll need a little bit of a time out. I will take a day off or just like turn off my phone for the weekend um, just to give myself a little bit of a grief break for a day or two. Yes. Yes. So important. And, and with the grief break, I know that you mentioned talking to people outside of your, um, your industry, right? So outside of veterinary social work. Mm -hmm. And I found that that's really helpful for me too, to talk to other professionals, other people and anywhere you go, like neighbors, networking events, just like other friends that aren't in our industry to get a break and to learn something new and, um, and get different perspectives Mm -hmm. on, on careers and life. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, Thank you. Exactly. And what would you say is the best part about your role? What do you enjoy most? Oh my God. So many things. <laughs> I love the connections that I make with the staff and the clients, just being even a small part of their lives and especially, so I'll back up a little bit for the staff. What is most meaningful for me is the veterinary medical field as a profession struggles with giving ourselves permission to feel our feelings. And and I still say are because I still feel very connected to veterinary medicine. We don't often gives ourselves give ourselves permission to really have emotions and experience things like grief about a patient or frustration about long work hours, whatever it is. And knowing that I can be a container for those folks to actually experience those feelings, maybe for the only part of their life and seeing the lights come on and understand that they're okay and that they're not shaming themselves anymore for having very human experiences and feelings is so gratifying. Um, It just... I love my individual counseling with the staff members and I love debriefing with the staff members after tough cases because I can just kind of see the relief that they get to show up as their human selves. That is amazing. And also the, honestly, the grief counseling that that I do one-on-one with the pet families is incredibly meaningful for me. Um, what I've found for a lot of pet loss clients is their grief is not validated by others in their social circle. Um, pet loss is absolutely a form of disenfranchised grief in our society, which is kind of funny because so many people are pet owners, but a lot of folks just don't know what to say to someone in grief and being able to be that person that um, they feel okay and safe and understood is in 
just I there uh, like I'm stumbling over my words because there's not even words for how meaningful it is for me. Yes, yes, I love that, and um, and it just speaks to the need for our work, right? For you to keep doing this work, um, for others to get involved. And, um, you know, there, I, I've seen some t- statistics. I pulled some up that, um, veterinarians actually have a really high suicide rate. Um, one yes. out of six very veterinarians has considered suicide and mm-hmm. nearly 70% of veterinarians have lost a colleague or a peer to suicide. I mean, that's very, very high. So, mm-hmm. you know, it just speaks to, um, it supports like what you're saying. If, if we're not expressing our emotions, how do we cope? How do we deal? Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of folks are surprised to learn that statistic of, of veterinary medical professionals, but is, it is absolutely accurate. Uh, there is, there are so many factors involved in that statistic, but I do believe one of them is the, as a profession, just not always feeling okay to show up as your human self. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you are there and you are doing some phenomenal work, Emily. Um, If we are interested in learning more about veterinary social work, if we want to get involved, but maybe we don't have any experience yet, what would be Mm -hmm. some tips on how we could get started? There's um, a couple of great organizations that people can look at. Um, The University of Tennessee Knoxville has a codified veterinary social work program within its MSSW program. Uh, That is, that was my, um, entry into veterinary social work. I'm actually in the program right now. They have two tracks, one for mental health professionals and one for animal health professionals. So my, I'm in the mental health track program. It's a postgraduate program, but they do sometimes if folks have a veterinary background like myself, they will allow you to start the program early. Um, And that they are a wonderful resource for folks. Um, There's lots of great information about the four core tenants of veterinary social work and um, info about the program and how and jobs that are out there. Um, I also just I also recommend the International Association of Veterinary Social Work. So we do have an association. It's I think it's just IAVSW.org. And those folks are great. Um, there are resources available, folks you can talk to if you're, you can also access a directory of veterinary social workers. Um, and I also definitely welcome folks to reach out to me because um, most of us veterinary social workers, we love talking about our job and we're very passionate about it. And we want to see more people getting into the field. Um, what I've seen some folks do recently is some folks have come to shadow me social workers that are interested in the field. So that might be an option if you have a veterinary social worker in your area. And I think it's great because you get a little bit of an insight as to how a veterinary hospital runs and what really goes on behind the scenes and get to sit down and ask questions. So those are the main resources I would recommend to folks at the start if they're interested. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Do you think that there's any extra certifications or volunteer work that we could do? Because a lot of times people want to know how to get involved before you're licensed. And I know that you, mm-hmm. you do not have your clinical license yet. So you've been doing this nope. you know, as an MSW. So that's really yep. encouraging to hear. Um, yes. You know, do you think people need extra trainings or volunteer? I would say it wouldn't be a bad idea to have some grief training under your belt that is specific to pet loss. There's lots of great books out there. The organization that I would recommend right off the bat for pet loss grief training is the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement. They have a training course that anyone can engage in um, to get you, you know, more trained in pet loss and bereavement because there are there are some things that are universal about the grief experience, but there are some things that are unique to pet owners that have lost their their kiddo. 
Um, so I think that would be really helpful. Um, some veterinary hospitals do allow folks to come in and shadow veterinarians that are, you know, folks that are interested in the profession in general. So often that's a possibility for folks and that's great, you know, again, just to get that, wow, this is actually what happens in a veterinary hospital. Because a lot of folks, we just, we don't know what happens. Um, and I'm, I'm also thinking um, there are also sometimes veterinary social workers at animal shelters. Um, so volunteering in an animal shelter and talking with the shelter staff. Lots of times there's veterinary folks on site and they can give you some really good insight because that's a whole other world of animal welfare concerns. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything else I would recommend. Um, the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement has a great book list as well. Their founder, Wal Dr. Wallace Seif, wrote a book called The Loss of a Pet, and that's a great foundational text for people who are interested. But I would say um, probably just connecting with a veterinary social worker and asking them some questions about their path. Yeah, you definitely do not necessarily have to have your clinical license in order to hold this job. I would say, though, if you're an LMSW like myself and you're getting this type of position, I would negotiate with your hospital about having your supervision covered um, because I could not do without my clinical supervisor. Yes, yes. So many great tips. Also, too, um, if you are in need of an outside clinical supervisor, check out the RISE directory. There may be someone who fits your yes. needs here. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Emily. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation. If people have more questions about veterinary social work, where can they find you? How do they connect? Sure. Um, so I have a Facebook page. It's Emily Carveth, Veterinary Social Worker. Please feel free to like my page and you can direct message me through there. That's the best way for the public to get a hold of me. Um, my hospital in Connecticut is Central Hospital for Veterinary Medicine, so there's a little info about me on the website, but I would encourage folks to check out my Facebook page and send me a direct message, and I, I love to talk to people. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you love this episode, be sure to subscribe and text this episode to a friend. If you want more, there are a few ways we can get to know each other and work together. First, definitely subscribe to the Friday resource email list. The link is in the show notes. And that's where you can learn more about the courses I offer, including clinical essentials, for the future therapist, and the Pulse Basics for medical social workers. I'll also be sending out occasional tips and resources and other happenings within the social work industry. And for all your clinical supervision needs, be sure to visit risedirectory.com. This is a national directory of clinical supervisors for social workers, and we also provide free resources that you can use within your own clinical supervision. Lastly, if you have more individualized needs, I do offer coaching, individual consultations, and am available for public speaking engagements for social workers and change makers. Lastly, the boring legal stuff, but very important. The information in this podcast is not meant to be a supplement for therapy, professional advice, or clinical supervision. This content is provided as is solely for informational purposes. It is not legal, health, or safety advice. I am not advising you as a therapist. Organizations should engage their own experts to ensure any adoptive measures are compliant with applicable laws and standards in their jurisdictions. The opinions expressed by individuals or organizations are their own and do not reflect the views or opinions of Social Workers Rise or Catherine Moore. References to specific products or organizations do not constitute any endorsement or recommendations by Social Workers Rise. <laughs>